Upon the eleventh instant I arrived in this county and was received with every good mark of attention and gladness that I could have wished. It was late October 1790. William Blunt, newly appointed governor of the territory of the United States south of the River Ohio, had arrived at Rocky Mount, the home of William Cobb. Here he would stay for the next one and a half years, making Rocky Mount his first capital. Blunt was a North Carolinian. He had served in the North Carolina House of Commons and the Constitutional Convention, where he made a favorable impression on George Washington. Governor Blunt owned one million acres in the new Southwest Territory and was familiar with the history of political upheaval in this land west of the Appalachians. White men originally considered the area to be a part of North Carolina. It had been given to various Englishmen in land grants by Charles I and then again, 34 years later, by Charles II. At the end of the French and Indian War, George III of England established the Proclamation Line of 1763 which made the Appalachian Mountains a western boundary, beyond which no white man could legally settle. But boundaries are hard to define in a wilderness, and western settlement continued, some settlers thinking, or choosing to think, that they were in North Carolina or southwestern Virginia. North Carolina had limited control over these western lands. Settlers were demanding protection from the increasing number of Indian raids, and the General Assembly could not accommodate them. Since North Carolina could not provide the protection they needed, local settlers organized the Watauga Association in 1772. It was the first American attempt at an independent and complete self-government by the consent of every individual. The Watauga Association authorized itself to negotiate, lease, and eventually to buy land from the Indians. The British governor of Virginia noted to his superiors that it sets a dangerous example to the people of America of forming governments distinct from and independent of His Majesty's authority. But soon the political picture had shifted again. On the eve of the American Revolution, the Indians were siding with the British, who were not supportive of more Western settlement. After the American Revolution began, the growing local population petitioned the North Carolina Provisional Government for alliance and protection as the Washington District. And in 1777, this district became Washington County. During the early stages of the American Revolution, local settlers were more concerned with the Cherokee Indians than with the British. William Cobb's daughter Penelope was married at Fort Womack during an Indian raid. But when the Cherokee War of 1776 ended, settlers turned their attention to the Revolution. When British commander Patrick Ferguson threatened to march his men over the mountains, hang local leaders, and waste the country with fire, if the settlers continued to oppose the king's troops, many frontiersmen, including William Cobb's son, Farah, rallied to the cause. Rocky Mount served as a rendezvous for some 950 local fighting men. William Cobb was instrumental in outfitting many of these soldiers who then moved on to fight a decisive victory over the British at King's Mountain in October of 1780. But while the end of the revolution resolved matters in the east, there was still no peace west of the mountains. Settlers continued to pour in from the east, infringing on Indian hunting lands. Negotiated agreements with local chiefs were often ignored by newcomers, and Indian resistance increased. When North Carolina ceded its western lands to the new central government in 1781, residents quickly formed the State of Franklin. By March of 1785, they had drafted a constitution, convened a general assembly, and elected as governor John Sevier, hero of King's Mountain. But the state was short-lived, as North Carolina soon rescinded the Session Act. Once the new federal constitution was ratified, the North Carolina legislature again transferred the western lands to the federal government. Congress wasted no time in accepting them. In May 1790, the area was designated a territory, the Territory of the United States south of the River Ohio, or the Southwest Territory. William Blunt was appointed governor as well as superintendent of Indian affairs. I am very well accommodated with a room with glass windows, fireplace, and so forth. 
Rocky Mount was an excellent choice for a first capital of the territory. William Cobb had built his home between 1770 and 1772, and the large two-story log house with glass in the windows and fine finish work was soon famous as a seat of hospitality. One historian said of William Cobb that he was a wealthy farmer, an immigrant from North Carolina, no stranger to comfort and taste, not unaccustomed to what in that day was called style, like the old Carolina and Virginia gentlemen, he entertained elegantly, with profusion rather than with plenty, without ceremony and without grudging. Like theirs, his house was plain, convenient, without pretension or show. His equipage was simple and unpretending. He kept his horses, his dogs, his rifles, even his traps for bidding. They felt themselves at home and never said adieu to him or his family without the parting regret and the tenderness of an old friendship. Reports indicate that William Cobb was host to Daniel Boone, John Sevier, and Andrew Jackson, as well as countless other travelers who were not quite as famous. William Cobb crossed the mountains from North Carolina in 1769, when there were literally only a handful of cabins in the wilderness. He built Rocky Mount in a fork of the Holston and Watauga rivers. Ties between these early settlers were very strong. Often extended families moved together. William Cobb built on land next to the homestead of his sister Mary and her husband, Henry Massengill Sr. William Cobb quickly established himself as a prominent citizen of the new settlement area. He served as both Commissioner and Justice of the Peace for Washington County, and Blunt appointed him as a Territorial Justice of the Peace for the same area. The first 10 months of 1791 were busy for Governor Blunt as he traveled throughout the territory, commissioned new officials, negotiated a treaty with the Cherokee Nation of Indians, and arranged for a census to be taken. The census returns for 1791, sent to Thomas Jefferson, then Secretary of State, reported a population of over 35,000 men, women, free men, and slaves in the Southwest Territory. From this beginning, William Blunt went on to lead the settlers of the territory through the necessary steps to statehood. Tennessee would become the 16th state to join the Union. The procedures which the citizens followed would establish the precedent for other territories seeking admission to the Union. By September, Governor Blunt was ready to return to North Carolina to bring his family to the new territory. Governor Blount to the Secretary of War, Mr. Cobbs, July 17, 1791. Sir, the necessity I am under to attend to some business of importance to myself in North Carolina which I left after a very short notice of my appointment and the great desire I have to see and remove my family from thence to this country compel me to solicit leave of absence from this territory from the 15th day of September to the 20th day of November. Blunt returned with his family in December and remained at Rocky Mount until the following spring when he moved into his new home at Knoxville. Life in the Southwest Territory must have seemed raw by Blunt's Eastern standards, but there was much that could be grown or made by the settlers. When families crossed the mountains, they carried with them the barest minimum of possessions. Once they established a homestead, they built houses, cleared land, and began the routines of daily living. Food was grown or caught. Corn was a staple, with the ground corn meal being used in a variety of ways. Kitchens were the center of much day-to-day -day activity, and quite often were housed in a separate building as a precaution against fire. Sheep on the farm provided wool. Flax and some small amounts of cotton were grown. Women spun, then wove, wool, flax, and cotton into clothing and household linens. Since the growing season for cotton was short, field hands were not required for large-scale cotton production. 
Less than 10% of the population were slaves, according to Governor Blunt's census. As more and more settlers poured down the Virginia Valley, blacksmiths and other non-agricultural tradesmen began to appear in the community. Before their arrival, many items had to be made directly on the farms. Utensils could be cast from pewter, and hinges and nails were made in small shops like the ones at William Cobb's. Shingles for roofs. Even furniture could be made at home. By 1791, there was some limited trade at stores in the territory, but most frontier families still grew and made what they needed. In the broad historical sense, statehood for Tennessee is just around the corner. But for now, it's an average day in 1791. Rocky Mount is, at this very moment, ensuring its place in history as the first capital of the Southwest Territory. But it's also busy just being a household, providing shelter, food, and clothing for the family who call it home. Consider yourself another one of the Cobb's guests and enjoy their hospitality.